Hello everyone and welcome to the Grumpy Surfer podcast. I'm the Grumpy Surfer and your host Ads Lyson. Well I've been very honoured to have a guest this week that I've been looking forward to talking to for a long time. He's an author, a surfer, Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt and a professor. He's written books such as Tie Sticks, Surfers, Scammers and the Untold Story of the Marijuana Trade, Law and War, International Law and American History, Facing Death in Cambodia. But on top of all these accolades, he surfed with some of the icons of surfing in Hawaii and America. And his jiu-jitsu coach is one of the most world-renowned and iconic jiu-jitsu personalities in the world, Hicks and Gracie. And his latest ghost-written novel is called Breathe, A Life in the Flow of Hicks and Gracie. So please enjoy my amazing conversation with a brilliant person, Pete Maguire. Pete Maguire, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Three questions like I do at the very start of all of these. How are you? Where are you? And have you surfed or trained today? Um, yes, I am fine. Uh, I'm in North Carolina. I surfed some small crumbly, not too bad waves this morning. And I trained with my horrendous 17 year old blue belt son called the Wolverine. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> you've got one of the two that I haven't done today. At least, uh, at least you've got in the water. Yeah, yeah. No, I try to, even if I body surf, I try to start most days in the ocean. Yeah, it's not far. It's about 10 minutes. And here, the water, it's gotten really, really cold. It's about, oh, man, it's dropped down to about 79 degrees Fahrenheit. So what's that in Celsius like? I don't know. I don't know what the conversion is. Warmer <laughs> than it's ever been on your continent in your lifetime. So, yeah, like warmer than Hawaii, basically. You're kind of putting me to shame a little bit because I live like five minutes. <laughs> I I live like five minutes from the sea, and I I call myself a um, a picky surfer no. because you know no. I, I only go in the water whenever there's a no decent waves coming through. No, I should really just go down in, and jump in. You do. You have to be in the ocean all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah you I've, need to start your day there. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said to you just before we uh, we put this on record, this podcast could go on for like three or four hours, I think, because, you know, you, you've kind of, you do the things that I love to talk about. Um, so I know a bit, a bit about you, you know, you're an author, a professor, a surfer, a BJJ black belt and a martial artist. It's kind of difficult for me to think, where do we start? So I, I guess... Let's go right back to the beginning and talk about, you know, where did you grow up and how did you get into all of these things? Well, I grew up in Southern California and uh, surfing was obviously a big part of the culture. My dad surfed and uh, yeah, I had a really uh, charmed surfing upbringing. Uh, I lived in um, Malibu Colony as a young kid and then Santa Monica Canyon and my family had a house in Santa Barbara. My grandpa lived at Rincon Point. And um and yeah, we uh I got to surf a lot of great waves um from the ranch, from Scorpion Bay to North Shore. And so um and then at at about just at my 19th birthday, I moved to Australia and lived in uh at Broken Head Point in uh northern new south wales and yeah i had a good run and then it went on and on but uh but i was lucky like my foundation was very solid in california surfing and uh got to see a lot of the greats growing up and um you know got got to surf all the great right points yeah am i right in thinking that you actually grew up like right on you know the point at rincon no my grandpa had a house there Oh, okay so um yeah so he would call me and say oh you know there's a giant swell the the it, it, the famous cinder block wall at rincon was his house and he'd say oh the wall's about to get washed down and then he would um 
you know, the waves weren't that big. He would get me up there to go surfing <laughs> and get me out of school. And so, um, yeah, so I got to surf Rincon in the winter, Malibu in the summer. Um, but above all, you know, San Juanico, Scorpion Bay, one of the best, kind of the summertime Jeffreys Bay of the uh, of of our area. I mean, one of the great like points in the world. It must be sort of quite ironic and iconic, really, to think you know you were surfing those waves back when it's. I mean, it was kind of crowded back then anyway. But now that kind of area is just swarmed with surfers, isn't it? I mean, it must it must you must have seen a massive change over the years. No, yes and no. But, um, you know, when it like, you, you got to get accustomed to surfing big junky surf and, and that really thins out the crowd and especially bigger surf, but, but bigger, a little bit junky, a little challenging surf, you know, you get rid of all of them like Rincon in a north wind giant swell that was george greeno's favorite and george greeno um you know i grew up you know he was kind of one of my idols he used to i'd see him go through the vacant lot next to my dad grandpa's house at rincon and uh then he was my neighbor in australia and so we became good friends but greeno's thing was always like b grade surf go for the big gnarly b grade surf because the a grade spots are going to be filled up. And when I was young, I surfed all the A grade spots. And, you know, oh, you sit there at Sunset or Broken Head Point or Malibu or whatever, laboring for a set way for hours and hours. But then as I got older, I kind of gravitated more towards gnarlier, you know, B grade spots. Did you do a lot of traveling back in those days? When I was 19, I went, um, yeah, a few days before my 19th birthday, I went to New Zealand, Australia, um, New Caledonia over about a year period, less, little less than a year, um, Nauru, Micronesia, Pea Pass, um, let's see, Rarotonga, a bunch of islands in French Polynesia, and then I came back to California, and then I kind of said, uh, California doesn't hold that much anymore, you know, and I still love it. Now that I go back as an older man, I see much more in it. But at that point in my life, I wanted to surf big waves. I wanted to, you know, and then, then I kind of gravitated towards the North shore. And so then, um, yeah, then my focus became the North shore and riding big, you know, bigger surf. And then I lived there for a fair period. Both my sons were born there. And that was when I was working, you know, in Cambodia. And so it was a very easy run. But yeah, that was, that was, I would say the real like high point in my surfing career was living uh, those years I did on the Northwest shore of Oahu, not the exact North shore on the more remote Kaina point stretch. So I had some really amazing uh absolutely unattended outer reef waves that i got to surf by myself most mornings i would paddle out in pitch black absolute black i would get up at three and uh have my coffee and my shit and uh i would line up with the lights on my house and it was better part of a mile paddle out and my usual board was a 9.7 single fin uh, Al Chapman and then if it was big I had a 10.2 balsa wood Al Chapman and um, you know it's about a mile out through a deep channel so it's an easy paddle out in pitch black but then you had to keep the house lights organized or you'd wind up under the maw of a gigantic peak and get murdered and it happened a few times it was a very unpleasant thing to get caught inside <laughs> in pitch black by a, you know waves that big but um yeah it was a great run and i was there for a long long time and um basically got to surf incredibly beautiful big waves by myself uh not the what i say big waves to me is 20 feet hawaiian paddle in which is Waimea um you know the uh, Makaha 
there aren't that many places that you know can honestly hold a 20 foot Hawaiian wave. And so Waimea, I I surfed there a few times, but it was crowded and a very tight takeoff area. So I don't like surfing crowds and people. I'm I, the waves I'm fine with, but if I'm having to kind of manage a crowd in giant surf, that I don't like. So I found this little place down the way about you know 15 miles from the North Shore proper where there were a lot of outer reefs that you could surf pretty unattended and so yeah I grew quite comfortable. <laughs> I've read quite a lot of surf literature over the years and I've, I've noticed in there that there's this stereotype that the North Shore is the is kind of the the mecca of surfing within Hawaii uh, but you you kind of forget that actually it's an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, surrounded by the ocean, where the swells coming in all directions. Oh yeah. So you've got you've got lots of places that people never really talk about. Yeah. Not that they ever would do. People like you that are going to kind of exploit that a little bit and and find those little nooks and crannies that that people wouldn't necessarily surf and that just through no, local knowledge, really. Yeah, and they. I mean, they're the you know, the B grade waves are, um, you know, the B grade waves are so good in Hawaii. And um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's remarkable what gets left on the table. You know, people are, um, you know, people are wanting to focus on the pipelines and the Waimeas and the this or the Rocky Points, because that's where um the photogenic surfing occurs but you know you can't photograph a wave that's a mile out you know on a second reef and so um yeah so i yeah as i said i mean i i would surf sunset all those other places but then I, when i moved to the northwest side of the island i had this whole litany of surf pretty much by myself so did you have any uh, surfing partners that you used to go with? You know, because when I you did, were... I did. I had one, uh, my Tahitian friend Stephen Niles, but honestly, I had to surf by myself almost always because um, I had this funny window where I lived on a nature preserve and no one could park on that preserve until 8 a.m. So I had that window from the time it got light to 8 a.m., which was, you know, two and a half hours or something. And so that's why I became obsessed with paddling out in the dark and having these just magic hours to myself. Like, you know, even Derek Dorner, it's one of his favorite waves. He couldn't, he couldn't come out when I could because he'd get like a $50 parking ticket or something and the police were very zealous. And so, um, yeah, so it, like I said, it was, uh, it was just a magic time. And uh, yeah, and then, you know, I had my second son and I actually got hit in the head by the corner of my pintail and um, probably got a concussion, I don't know, but it was in the dark and uh, sun hadn't come up. And I was bleeding like a stuck pig and uh, I got myself in no problem. I was a lifeguard and had been through worse, but I was kind of like, wow, you fucked up. Like you, you know, like it was going great until you fucked up. And so then I, I made myself like go, I drove straight into town, bought a helmet, a gaff helmet, and I made myself serve with a helmet. And then I was kind of like, God, you got two kids and it wasn't really as fun anymore i felt a little irresponsible <laughs> um going out in the dark every morning by myself and i you know as i said i did that for years just because there was no one else to surf with and that, that was my window you know there's always that sort of personal personal journey isn't there when you're when you're surfing on your own i've always been quite i, I guess an, a loner in a way because and this is not going to sound, I don't mean this to sound quite big headed, but the majority of the people that I have surfed with in the past over the last sort of like, you know, 20 odd years have been kind of like beginner level. 
Yeah. So when I want to go, I want to go and surf, you know, some good waves at good spots where yeah. if I took a beginner there, they're just, they're, they're probably going to get hurt probably. I, dead I, I don't weight. know. Yeah, dead weight. So when, when I when I go, I look at the forecast. I have to be careful with that. And I nine times out of 10, I'm going on my own. Like you say, you've got your, your sort of time specific with it, you know. So we... As you get older, you get kids and the family and your friends that you surf with as well. They've got the same thing and they might not have the window that ties in with you as well. So yeah, um, it's it's yeah, kind Jim. of one of those things. <laughs> yeah, I do. No way. Yeah, there's no way. Like people, oh, let's surf. Well, I have friends here want to surf with me. I say, yeah, look for my truck at this place. And if you see it, I'm surfing. If not, I'm not. Like I'm not. Oh, and we're going to have coffee together and hold hands like fuck that. Like, that's not my culture, you know. And uh, and as I said, I I do tend to go to the ocean every morning at oh dark 30 still and take a gauge of it. And if it's shitty, I'll at least go body surfing and get in the ocean and uh, swim some butterfly and get some salt in my gills. And then I'm home before anybody's up. And uh, yeah, it's not, you know, and I was a very good uh, paddler, like I was a lifeguard. So I paddled the rescue board. So I did that too. So I liked the ocean. I like being in the ocean. And I worked with the military with combat rescue boats and all that. And I was really good at driving boats in the surf, but I wasn't in the water and I didn't, I, I liked it. I could do it fine. It was a trade. But it wasn't the same, you know. Like I want to be in the in the water, you know. <laughs> I read a few books a couple of years ago about the the human race and and how our sort of like our natural draw is to the is, is to the ocean, and I, I find it I find it quite interesting, really, that the majority of populations really that are, that that started really are all kind of round round coastal areas and when people go on holiday what well, you know what do they want out of a holiday nine times out of ten they want to go buy a swimming pool or they want to they want to go to the sea and and be in the sea and in the water and i think there's there's definitely some sort of subconscious reptilian appeal to oh, it. yeah absolutely do you ever feel worse when you left the ocean do you do you do you feel worse from when you went into the ocean and you left the ocean never you always feel slightly refreshed and better. And um, yeah, it's funny. And, uh, you know, here we have, uh, I was body surfing Saturday, actually. And it's really good body surfing on top of surfing. And body surfing is really important too. Mat riding, body surfing, paddling. These are all things you can do when the waves suck. And, um, but it's really sharky here. And the, uh, the, First, the little um, uh, the little Menhaden were coming, then the mullet were coming, then the bluefish were coming, smashing them. And I just knew the bull sharks were out there somewhere. I'm like, I'm waiting for the tax collector to come. And you see those bull sharks and they're scary. And they come in like that, just gliding in. And, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, the ocean is, um, you know, a live and viable place. We'll come back to talking about surfing in a minute, but yeah. I'd like to touch on your kind of jujitsu and your martial arts journey. So, yeah. you know, how did you how did you start getting into that? Uh, in graduate school, um, you know, I had grown up in a play in an aggressive place in Southern California where it was a lot of fighting and um, everybody was fairly athletic. Um, but it was really in graduate school when I was getting my PhD at Columbia. Um, that I met a former pro kickboxer named John Peretti, who became the promoter of extreme fighting, and then the UFC matchmaker before the Zufas bought it. Um, and so uh, I surfed much better than him, and he fought much better than me. And, um, and he started training me first in kind of kickboxing and Wing Chun and all around real dirty fighting. And then he became a student of Gene LaBelle. And, uh, and then 
you know, introduced us to this really brutal grappling that would get you kicked out of any jujitsu school today. And then uh, I went and started training with Hickson. And, um, and so Peretti had kind of prepared me to deal with, with Hickson's Pico Academy. And, uh, and then Hickson and I got along very well. And, uh, and, you know, we all kind of stuck together for a long time through a lot of political shifts. And, uh, you know, it was a, very different back then. You know? Is it right? Am I saying that you helped write his book, Breathe? Yeah, yeah, I was the ghostwriter. Yeah. How did you find writing that? Oh, you know, I mean, we've known each other now, God, for creeping up on 30 years. And so I was friends with him before he won his first fight in Japan. I know all his kids. I mean, we're very close. And so I'd been kind of collecting notes and, uh, we'd been talking about it for a long time and then the COVID came and everything kind of stalled and he said, okay, let's go ahead and do it. And it was a very good book. I mean, he, uh, you know, I said, look, if I'm to do this, given the other stuff I write about genocide, war crimes, all that, I can't, you know, we can't dance around some of the elephants in the room. You have to address these things head on. And he did. And so, um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it, it came out actually better than I, I expected or imagined. I find it quite strange, actually. So when I started doing some research on you over the, uh, over the last couple of days and, and I looked into some of, the, uh, some of the books and some of the novels and, and the, uh, the sort of like the political writing that you've, that you've done, um, and that popped up, I was like, no way. I bought that like, <laughs> I bought it on pre-order and I saw, I can't remember how we kind of got to talking and I was like no way Pete Maguire wrote that and then it was like there and I was like this is this is a bit weird <laughs> in what way sometimes I don't want to go all sort of like hippie on you not hippie yeah. sort of like uh, you know, go ahead. where all the stars align and stuff like that and then it just be coincidences don't become coincidences and now I'm talking to you now and I you know, I don't think we even probably even started talking when I bought that book. And yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of super random. It is and it isn't. I think there are a lot of people, you know, I think we were met, uh, you know, we met through our friend, um, you know, who's uh, the famous nug on my sour milk dispatches. And um, I, in addition to doing the writing and this and that, I also... Um, you know, uh, worked in combat rescue with different military forces and always had great respect for the British and dealt with some of the gentlemen from pool. And, um, and, uh, you know, and that's how we met basically. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, it's, you know, I guess I bore easily. <laughs> from an outsider looking in and, and looking back over your past, your, your life has very much been kind of like, you could almost, I, I don't know, I'm probably going to make you big headed saying this, but you could almost, you know, make a film out of it, I guess. Yeah. No, yeah, it's just weird creature of fate, you know, and I grew up pretty privileged. So I had a lot of options and, um, and there's no denying that was a, was a part of it. Um, but I didn't take the easiest options and, uh, I was always kind of curious and, and, uh, wanting, you know, wanting to do more physical things and, um, and seriously intellectual things, as opposed to, you know, making money or inheriting daddy's business or something like that. And, uh, yeah, so I, I just, I don't know. I, it's a pretty organic path. I followed a strange one, but, um, but it's been, uh, yeah, it hasn't been boring. How did you get into journalism and writing pieces and writing books? Was it something that you kind of have always done or did you? Well, yeah, I got my PhD in history at Columbia. So, you know, I was on track at 28 to be a professor and do all that. But um, it was so stultifyingly boring um, that I couldn't imagine okay now oh that's it now I sit in some university and act smart um for the rest of my life so 
I, my great grandfather was a judge at the Nuremberg trials and my PhD dissertation was on Nuremberg and laws of war. And uh, uh, I had an opportunity to begin investigating Khmer Rouge war crimes in Cambodia, right when I got my PhD. So I went straight into that and, um, and that took on a life of its own. And I taught on and off here and there, but I did that for a better part of 10 years on and off. And, uh, you know, but I always taught, I always kind of juggled about three different careers at once. Taught martial arts was probably the, yeah, I was the first uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu teacher in Cambodia. And, um, and they just won their first gold medal in the, uh, I forget which games, the Asia games or something in Jiu Jitsu. And yeah. so it's nice to see jujitsu as a like deep foothold in Cambodia. You must have seen a massive change over over the last sort of like few decades in in jujitsu from you know training with Hicks and then and some of like the the main old school players. Oh, yeah. To to where it is now, I mean, like the ADCC just happened a couple of weekends ago, which was uh, probably one of the biggest shows ever to happen for jujitsu, especially with with the names that were on on that card it must be quite sort of gratifying being a black belt and and seeing the growth there as well and being in that position where you've been with those people too it's a different world in a lot of ways because um you know by the time i started training jiu-jitsu i was almost a black belt in jeet kune do and so um it was always fighting and real fighting and uh and back then, jujitsu was very much that way. And there were always challenge matches and guys coming in. And it was a very, um, you know, very honest kind of self-defense environment. Then that shifted. And uh, now I kind of see jujitsu as there's, you know, there's about three different, four different sports under the roof of jujitsu. And so... Um, and some don't, I mean, and I have great respect for some of these guys. They're incredible athletes and stuff like that, but it doesn't have that much to do with what, you know, my jujitsu. And so I teach a lot and I teach, you know, they have to, they have to stand up, they have to fight, they have to protect themselves from punching. I have a horrible device that I've invented. That's a boxing glove taped to about, a, uh, an eight foot piece of pipe that I can use like almost like a pool cue that I'll punch you in the face with that you have to get around to get me in a clinch. And then you get me in a clinch and say, oh, stop, okay, I'm old. Like, all right, don't take me down. So <laughs> yeah, so like if you can't play that game of dodging horrible straight punches and get the clinch, then you're incomplete. If you can't escape from a headlock, you're incomplete. If you can't escape from a bear hug, you're incomplete. Like. There are these key pieces of jujitsu that you have to know. And I have guys in my town that'll be purple belts, brown belts that are friends. And I'll say, hey, now you have to come train with me because you're going to get your black belt. But you have these holes like you, you know, I say, OK, protect yourself. And they lean into me like that head first. And you're going to if you're lucky, you'll get punched in the face. If you're unlucky, you get kicked in the face. And so those elements i believe for a black belt need to be kept alive you know and uh and so um i keep them alive <laughs> one of the things that i i was very passionate about before i left the marines was that as the Royal Marines commandos yeah. all the guys were you know when i when i was a young marine to like when i left a lot of people were very much like they were hard or they could win a fight or the stereotypical. Yeah. I could just knock you out whenever or when, yeah, yeah. you know, cause, cause they're big sort of like meaty guys. Oh yeah. But I did a, I did a course, Royal Marines close combat course, which is kind of like the Max stuff that the, uh, the USMC do. And it derived from that combinations of lot, lots of different martial arts, real simple, basic techniques, takedowns, submissions, arrest and restraint, all that sort of thing. And what, what really, kind of frustrated me was that the the guys in the military in the marines when i left i was trying to incorporate this so it was kind of part of their their weekly routine so they 
they did like at least once a week, whether it was a takedown, perhaps sure. a submission, wearing kit or something like that, just to kind of keep that continuity going over and over again. Because you know and I know training jiu-jitsu or the form of martial arts, if you don't stay on top of your drills and skills, your skill fades massive. Sure. Having having one class every six months is really no, not, useless. It's yeah. not going to work. And, and what I found was is because it wasn't mission specific to what the guys were, were doing or what they were training to do within that six week sort of cycle, is that they 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 weren't interested. And and funnily enough, one of my friends uh, that I trained with, he's a, a top sort of Muay Thai guy. Uh, little little fella he was one of the tra- sergeants in charge of uh doing some of these boarding teams and they were using some uh, officer cadets uh, and i'm not being sexist but there was a there was a couple of girls there uh and hats off to them like they they played the role well you know come uh non-combative and combative entries so when the guys went in the four-man team went in to clear a room this one girl was playing up and it took three of the four man team to take her down. Now they had helmets on, they had body armor and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I wasn't there, but apparently she was going nuts and it took three of them to take him down. Now this is like, you know, these are full weighted, you know, Marines. And, and we see it in police scenarios across the world and, it, and it's, it's pathetic. I mean, it's just, they don't understand they don't understand managing distance. They don't understand handles. They don't understand the kind of pain that LaBelle, you know, that's the thing about LaBelle. LaBelle was all pain, submission, and um, pain compliance. And and I've incorporated a lot of that into jiu-jitsu. And I teach my students like, okay, you can't get the guillotine from the guard, but grab his chin. And as you torque it this way, shift your hips this way bend his spine and his whole spine and neck go and you know people squeal like pigs from stuff like that and uh and so i think that's a huge mistake and again the the, that's why police will rely on guns they'll rely on tasers all these silly things where if you and i go and there's some drunk acting stupid you'll cover me and I'll walk to him. Hey, Jimmy, Hey, take it easy. Oh no, I'm just here to talk. Boom. Gotcha. And that's it. And then trip clinch trip, boom on your back, zip tied. Thanks for coming out. It ain't rocket science. And if you don't understand that and you're not feeling that engagement, you're not feeling that connection and understanding it's a lot of it's timing too, you know, like, you look at Hickson's front stomp kick. I teach that a lot, the pisau. Like if you can really throw that fucking thing, everybody's going to, and at that moment, they hesitate and back off so their knee doesn't get broken in half. Boom, you're under their arms and they're on their back. It's not that complicated. And it, it takes practice and practice and practice and timing and timing and timing. But like you said, if you do it every six months, come on, you know, and- uh you know i don't know how how large the female commando was maybe she was 185 i don't want to be sexist but if she wasn't and there's three or four dudes i mean i don't get it that's pathetic i hate to say that i'm a great fan of of the british marines um and did you ever get to train with howder with the great uh, Howder? no he came, he came over and did a seminar uh, a few uh, a few years back, he's uh, one of the best. Yeah, well, Love I had a, I had a, I had a photo taken next to him, and he looks like he's my dad, if I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he's one of the best, and he's kind of comes from the same weird amalgamated background as I do. He's a real Southern Californian, but a great teacher, and uh, who brings a lot of other elements into jujitsu. And uh, yeah, and I think that's that's the big change and i i have you know students who they're like well look we never ever fight on our feet we only start sitting down or on our knees or whatever and i don't actually have what i call midget wrestling i don't allow knee to knee somebody's going to start side control mounted guard you're going to start in a real position you're not going to play the midget wrestling game 
because that's that's not a real game you know those aren't real distances you know so i have a friend that comes from an mma background and he won't wear a gi so no. when, whenever we train together he'll he'll just come down and he spats in his rash guard and good yeah he's uh he's uh He's he's a very challenging guy to to be against because his wrestling's oh, yeah. very good and he's pinning and he he definitely uh, definitely makes you think. Oh yeah. And uh, you know my my takedowns and my takedown defense has to be uh, has to be definitely on the ball. I think over the years as well that I, I, I'm, this is going to sound I don't know a little bit weak I guess but uh, I, uh, I I used to hate I used to hate takedowns. Um, I think when I was when when I first started doing jiu-jitsu, uh, the guys that I was training with were like, you know, ADCC, Naga, Judo, black belts had done a lot of yeah. grappling before. And, uh, you yeah. know, I'm only I'm only 170, you know, I'm what, yeah, yeah. Uh, 77 kilos. And these guys are like big guys and they're using me as a demo man and they'd launch me through the floor. And I'm, I remember once saying to this one guy, I was like, Please don't let me again. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's a different game, you know, but then you, cause I trained a lot of wrestlers and I enjoy training wrestlers cause they're, you know, and I had some incredibly skilled wrestlers that I taught jujitsu to. And um, they were so easy to teach and they would, they would pick something up so fast and you could catch them in something once and you'd never catch them again. Um, but when we would stand on our feet and I would say, okay, I'm going to punch you and you're going to try to tackle me. They were not used to getting hit and that leaning forward with their head thing was, you know, so everybody has their weird little weak spot and for the wrestlers, uh, being punched was very much it. And, um, and so yeah, and, and working off um, basically a straight strong side jab was very disconcerting because I'm right-handed and I fight, Freddie taught me how to fight lefty. And so I fight lefty, so I have my strong jab forward, then I fight out of a crouch or a squat, so there isn't that much to take down. And, um, and But you have to let them commit. You have to let them like, get their hands on you but not get you in and then you, you have huge opportunities for knees and elbows and striking. And, and that was shocking to the wrestlers. They were really like, whoa, this is a different world. And they're quick studies and tough guys and all that. But, um, you know, wrestling is its own game with a very static set of rules. And, uh, and it was... Um, yeah, as I said, it was it was a, a big wake up call for guys who are much better athletes than I was, much stronger, much everything. But again, management of space, knowing gap, distance, things like that. They don't have to worry about that in the game they play. They can lean forward. The guy cuffs your head and you cuff his head in real fighting. You get fucking knee in the face and all your teeth knocked out for that. So, um, yeah, it's just it's. It's taking the good pieces of all these things and combining them. I never liked single and double leg takedowns. I was, if you don't learn those as a child out of the cradle, like the American wrestlers do, these guys start at like six years old. The American wrestlers are fucking unbelievable. And so by the time they get to college and they're on that track, if you misstep once, they'll stutter step you, you misstep once, boom, you're flying in the air and they're that good. And, uh, and the judo guys equally so, like they have the same thing. They get you, da, da, da. And, and, but then, you know, you start punching them and kicking them, then their game, they don't, they can't play the same game. So, um, you know, and that's the beauty of Gene LaBelle was Gene LaBelle, you know, he truly knew boxing, he truly knew wrestling, and he truly knew judo. And he was not at all prejudiced about taking pieces of any of those things and combining them together with little or no ego, given how good he was. And, um, and I don't, I didn't, I started writing about LaBelle recently since he died. And, and I didn't realize how much Gene LaBelle I've I've incorporated into my martial arts game 
which is just, you know, get them in side control and, you know, pin one hip and put the other elbow on their neck and push their hip and their neck and just like spine. It's a lot of, it's a lot of what genius calls stretching people out. And you see, you know, and my kid, my 17 year old does a lot of this and you see people not necessarily even in submissions, but they just don't want to be there anymore. And they kind of just give him something or give me something. They're just like, this isn't fun anymore. And so in the very mannered game of gi jiu-jitsu, I like it. I was there in England. Uh, I was a fellow at War Warwick University in 2019 for a month or something, a little less. And I taught uh, some jujitsu there and it was interesting uh and coventry is nearby right there yeah there oh, warwick university is probably about where i grew up is about 30 minutes away it's not that far okay yeah and so there were some tough guys from an academy in coventry that came and um and so they had some good judo students and other student groups and stuff like that but um i had one little you know kind of nasty guy try to like footlock me and and i'm sure i'm demonstrating i'm being nice hey do this go slow and the guy like tries to hook a heel and um and i just fucking bitch slapped him and uh you know and he's an english guy with real fair skin and it was like january so he had a big handprint on his face and then he kind of looked like he's gonna cry for a second i think he was from the upper class because warwick's an expensive place but in any case um, you know, I said, look, that's the defense. Like you're going to grab my ankle and not protect your head with two hands committed to my ankle. You're going to eat a big old right. And that's the least of it. That's just the beginning. And, uh, and it was, it was interesting, you know, it was eye opening. And then, um, yeah, so I had some good students at work. We had fun and, uh, I taught them a lot of, you know, kind of real life stuff. I find the the foot game within jiu-jitsu is is kind of exploded over the last sort of like 10 years I think because of the because of the celebrity kind of guys that are out there now you've got the you know John Donahers and the guys from Henzo's and well John's also... an old John's an old friend and so John was uh you know I was at Henzo's John's like first week and um and I had been doing foot locks and heel hooks and all that with LaBelle as early as 90, 95, 96. And, uh, and that was at that time very much frowned upon. You know, oh, that's dirty, that's cheap, that's this, that's this. Yeah, and it was, um, and I always found that very odd. I was like, wait a minute, you guys play this open guard game, your feeder hovering it's an easy boom slap a figure four on a foot and you got a toe hold you know and uh and then suddenly it became the great craze and john is a brilliant guy and a very systematic guy and i know he's he spent hundreds if not thousands of hours looking at videotapes and pulling it apart but um none of it's new you know it goes back to carl gotch it goes back to luthez and Carl Gotch, above all, the guy who trained all the Japanese, who trained, um, you know, he trained Anoki, he trained, um, you know, he was over there for, for, yeah, he, I think trained Anoki for the Muhammad Ali fight. So, you know, the old, and you guys in the fucking UK, I mean, you guys deserve a lot of credit, Billy Wigan. And, um, you know, that's what, all those guys talk about in the most reverential terms is the snake pit in Wigan, I think. I don't remember exactly where, but you know, it's the coal mine, British coal miner wrestlers. And that's what um, Gene LaBelle and um, uh, Lord Tallyho Bleers. Have you ever heard of him? I haven't, no. Oh, you must. You have to do your homework. He was a British pro wrestler who moved to Hawaii and then became a famous surfer. And his son was a world surfing champion, Jimmy Bleers, and a lifeguard at Sunset Beach. And his daughter was a great surfer and famous for a topless poster of her surfing. But uh, Bleers, you know, he, he was the one who told me about like 
the snake pit and all that stuff and, and LaBelle as well. And so, you know, you had these guys that were, were playing that vicious catch as catch can wrestling or grappling really, which grappling is anything goes. And so, you know, again, none of this is new. I think going back to teaching and, um, and especially this modern age of, of, of jiu-jitsu and grappling that I think because the, the flashy stuff looks really cool. In fact, I had this conversation uh, tonight after I, after I finished training about you've got all these YouTube channels where people are doing all this really cool stuff, but we were kind of like, how much of that is actually kind of functional? You try doing a Baron Bola on somebody that kind of knows what, what they're doing or throw, you know, a lad said to me today, I had you in a, a single leg X and I was trying to sweep you to get a leg lock on. He's like, how did you say strong? And I was like, well, I just put my weight on my leg and just cleared your feet out of the way. That's how I did it. There's, there's no like, there's no like mega science to it. And I think people's, people's game these days is very much trying to do the cool stuff instead of trying to get the foundation of, of their, of their grappling to, to build upon Instead, they're trying to do all this cool stuff first and then do the other the foundations later. Unless you have a good base, a good guard pass, a good like these, you can, I have, I have some monster white belt and blue belt students that have about four things that they do and they do all of them perfectly and they don't deviate from them and you can know what they're going to do from a mile coming but they do it well and they smash guys. And uh, uh, if you're learning a, you know, Barambolo or any of these kinds of things, even the De La Hiva, and you don't have those basics really like poured into your foundation, um, you're building on sand and you really need, you know, above all base, connection engagement like real knowledge of these things not these techniques right and so i you know because i basically teach people to create discomfort and then be an opportunist based on the discomfort because someone will give you something they're going to just turn they're going to give you an arm they're going to want to get out of there so and then hickson i you know took this from him it's like create discomfort and be there waiting you know waiting on the other side with the with the rifle boom one shot one kill you know you're not struggling you're not you know in this sloppy fight you know and and i'm you know very proud of my son because he has this very sophisticated game and crone had the same one where something you don't have it but you'll You'll pretend you want it to set something up to go to this, and then you have a third move already in your back pocket. So when you're moving three moves ahead, that's serious jujitsu. And um, yeah, and and it's you know I see the kids, I get them, they come here, and I say, and they try some fucked up thing, and I say, you've been on YouTube again, haven't you? And they're like, oh, I saw this thing. I was like, yeah. I said, look, if it doesn't come from John Jock or Hickson, or Hegan, or, you know, a couple other guys, like, don't, don't bring it here, you know, and, uh, and then they, I make them pay. <laughs> That's what I tell my students, yeah. they go onto YouTube, and they go, I think my, one of them the other day came back and said, oh, I've, I've just seen this awesome, this awesome move, it's called the ham sandwich, and I was like, what the fuck's a ham sandwich? It's just a knee slicer, basically. Yeah, yeah. Pretty well, and that's the other thing. And I, so I was talking to Hickson about this. I said, like, the, they have all these names for these half positions and adjustments and things that, that like, we had four names for everything. And it was like, okay, you know, and okay, you kind of like maybe grapevine them a little bit or something. But it was, you know, the X guard, the this guard, the that guard. I have no idea what any of it means and I'm, I'm conscientious i'm a conscious conscientious objector i don't want to know i don't i just say i don't know i just you know i do the thing and yeah and it's basic like you know but my students can defend themselves from a punch from the bottom at any time and if they don't they get slapped because 
that was the way we were brought up, that you always had to be prepared to defend a punch. And if you weren't, you got slapped. And, and, uh, and that's the way the original Gracie's were that, you know, you got taxed if you were lazy or got too kind of carried away. Like I said, take a foot with two hands like that. Don't protect your face. You're going to get hit in the face. And, uh, yeah. So <laughs> let's redirect this conversation a little bit to sort of some of the books that you've written. And yeah. uh, I see that you've written a couple of stuff about the marijuana trade and you spent a lot of time in Cambodia as well yep. uh, with yeah. your book, uh, Facing Death in Cambodia. How did you come about to get yourself into those situations, especially the Cambodia book? Because, you know, you, you kind of integrating yourself in, into a society and, and, and looking into things that are kind of life threatening to an extent. Uh, well, it was the most egregious, outstanding genocide, in my opinion, since World War II. Totally unaccounted for. Um, I had just gotten my PhD in, you know, more or less war crimes. My, my PhD advisor was the chief prosecutor at Nuremberg, and the UN was pulling out after a two to three billion dollar occupation of Cambodia. No accountability, no trials, no nothing. And I thought, my, this is odd. Um, and uh, I had some old high school friends who had uh, been working at a prison called Tool Slang, Khmer Rouge Torture Execution Center. Roughly 20,000 went in, roughly 20 survived, maybe more, not much. And um, everyone was photographed and interrogated. And, um, and so that was the real repository of Khmer Rouge war crimes, that prison. And so they were archiving, documenting the photos. And then I went over to help them and met some of the survivors, uh, executioners, guards, photographer, and uh, got them all to talk over about an eight or 10 year period. And so um, at that point, I thought no one would ever be tried. It was more just creating an empirical record of the atrocities so that they couldn't be challenged. Um, and then lo and behold, the UN and Cambodian government held a, a trial, a kind of a flawed trial, but nonetheless a trial. And I gave them all the evidence I had found. And, um, but yeah, I felt that that was that needed that needed to be accounted for. It was when, just when Bosnia was kicking off, and then Rwanda was going on. When I was in Cambodia, I was watching the Rwandan genocide on television in Cambodia, and so the nine early nineties were a odd time. You know, it was kind of the end of the Cold War until two thousand one was this like period of magical thinking where it was like, oh, war, there'll never be, a, well, Americans will have wars without casualties. That was Bill Clinton. And, um, and world government and the ICC and war crimes trials, and we're gonna indict Henry Kissinger and the Chinese, and I was like, you guys are smoking crack, you know? And, and it was an unpopular position to take at the time, but it was so obviously true, I couldn't, lie to myself and uh and so that's you know that's that went on and on and on and i've been you know written a lot about war crimes trials international law um i'm kind of a heretic when it comes to the like the un and the soros uh ngo position but i think history will bear me out and i think history will not bear them out um i don't believe that trials uh really do much more than if you're lucky punish the guilty exonerate the innocent to ask or believe that they're going to change societies to me is is childish and infantile and so um but not a very popular position these days it's you know again it's kind of coming more we're moving back towards an old you know an old european balance of power world a uh, very brutal world. And uh, I don't think a lot of people have the, you know, the, the they can see it, but they can't draw the, the conclusions are too frightening for them to draw with. with the, when you're talking about conclusions of what people see is, 
a yeah. lot of stuff these days is is driven by the media so what they get told and because they don't we're very much in the generation where everything's electrical you can research stuff onto the internet but you you don't really know how much of that stuff you're researching is true and how much has been placed there as kind of like propaganda as well i mean right. i i really really i dislike the news i dislike any form of reporting media to an extent because through my time you know in the, in the service I, it, it has its negative and it's positive effects you know you, you the propaganda about whether the taliban are doing this or what you're doing sure. and, uh, which then leads to sort of like the, the serials that you do were trying to kind of play each other off and i don't really like that unless i have like a solid piece of information that's come from somebody on the ground that is telling me how it is i i kind of just pay a little bit of lip service to it well i mean and and for example you know you and i have friends who are babysitting the reporters at the various fronts of these wars so i have to you know you read the bullshit that they write and then our various friends tell us about babysitting these reporter dipshits and and the nonsense that went on behind the story and this and that and the other thing and half these people i know anyway and i know you know you i i i'm in a unique position because after 9 11 my first book law and war got dragged into some of the early terrorism cases so i worked with some of the defense lawyers on u.s constitutional grounds as we have a constitution we should abide by it blah 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 but then I ran afoul of the Bush administration for doing so. And then um, on the other end, I, uh, you know, as of late, was not a huge advocate of the Ukraine war. And I've run afoul of, of people for that. And, um, and none of my positions are based really in anything much more than common sense in the US Constitution. And my friends on the ground in harm's way um that are telling me what they're hearing and seeing i've got a friend at the moment that's kind of doing his own thing out in out in the ukraine and uh, he's just going out there and and reporting uh, just driving around the, the the ukrainian front with the russians um and he's just you know putting videos out on instagram and and, and putting a few posts out there and just kind of getting like real real world reporting and, and and the information that he's getting back from you know the civilians there and and the russian soldiers and he's going out to the to the trenches you know on, on the front line kind of interesting seeing the, the the conflicts of interest really that the propaganda that the media is actually portraying or isn't portraying anymore because it's kind of like you know in the in the back of everyone's peripheral mind at the moment because other things have happening in the world and it's not really that much of an interest to people anymore no and that's the tragedy to me is the short attention span of the west and that's where i you know i mean we've poured incredible amounts of money to ukraine but i've seen afghanistan i've seen iraq i mean you were in these places and how did that work out you know, and we threw everything financially. Again, you can have, you know, you can win battles and you can have military gains on the ground, but if you don't have a con coherent political objective, then, you know, what's it all worth? Except for, you know, lost lives of innocent young, you know, mostly men. Um, and that was what I really saw, you know, with with iraq where i had you know young marines would come back and say yeah you know i was my second tour and it was kind of weird we went back and we were fighting the guys that were our allies on my first tour and uh and so you know with that kind of coherence it's difficult to chart a straight course and and you know this is all shades of gray in this world and you know and i have always been much more uh suspicious of the chinese the russians seemed kind of like a broken empire to me um and i was kind of surprised when the cold war got revived again during the clinton campaign and it was the russian this and the russian that and i was like man this sounds like 
Joseph McCarthy in the 1950s and the Russian bogeyman. Like I'll take the Chinese bogeyman any day because I'm watching the Chinese bogeyman building, you know, military airstrips in Cambodia and taking over islands and, you know, like that's real. And uh, yeah, so it's interesting. I took a lot of rounds for being cynical about the Ukraine invasion and surprising number. I was like, wow, this is this is an American war. Like, I, you know, how is it that, you know, I'm not patriotic because I'm not all in following the same neocons that led us into Iraq, into Ukraine. I mean, that's my biggest problem is that our foreign policy establishment is held hostage by the humanitarian hawks and the, and the neocons who joined ranks after, you know, in the name of hating Trump. And so once Trump came in, who I'm not a supporter of, didn't vote for, but everybody, you know, went all in and like get rid of Trump. And we saw a lot of very strange and sinister allegiances form. So mate, that's like well over my head. I'm, I'm just kind of <laughs> I just kind of like, yeah, I'll just see how this plays out. Yeah. Oh well, good. <laughs> when when I went away and, and did things in Iraq and Afghanistan, I, it it was all very much kind of I'm going out there, I'm going to go and do my job, and I'm going to come back. I've never really been into politics or following anything like that, because I, it's going to sound really bad. I don't, I don't have an interest in it. I don't yeah. have like, I don't have a connection with it whatsoever. I just see, especially from a, a, a political and British point of view, is I just see these high class guys get into office, and then they're going to do the opposite of what they said they're going to do so they can make a little bit of money. They become a little bit famous. And then when they leave like your Tony Blair's and those oh, yeah. type of people, they then become super high in the, in the UN and within Europe and they're making a shitload of money and they don't really give a fuck because at the end of the day, they're just out for it for themselves. Yeah. You know? and no, no, I think you're, you're smart to take that point of view. And um, you know, it's like, accepting the things you can't change and uh but it's um i think you speak to a much more larger important point which is it's just complete and utter corruption and rot and that you know it's kind of like everybody quote as they say in the mob you know getting over and and they're just getting over they get and we're the we're the we're the marks we're the rubes we're the fools. And, uh, and that's the part, especially in America, where I know these young guys enlisted in the Marines at 18 did four, five year long combat tours, much more than any soldiers in American history have ever been asked to do. You know, in Vietnam, you did one tour, you know, one year, that's it, game over. Some people went back for more, this and that. But this thing of taking housewives who, you know, went into the National Guard to get a college education, and you're sending them to Iraq and Afghanistan, and they, they, you know, it just, it was gratuitous. And uh, that's the part. And I, I counsel veterans, so I see the human wreckage that was left in the wake of, of this. And, you know, a lot of these young Americans their whole best years of their life. When I was in Byron Bay, when I was in Tahiti, when I was, you know, surfing carelessly and all that, they spent in Mosul and Kandahar and whatever else. And, uh, and that probably you as well. You know? <laughs> well, I think I played my cards, right? Because what I did was every time I came back and I had a leave period, I went away and I was in Indonesia somewhere or in yeah. or in Australia. You know, I I went on these uh, trips on my own and you know I I, I created my own narrative to a certain yeah. extent. Um, but you know, I, I find it really difficult these days as well because especially sort of towards the end of uh, end of my career, I used to do these uh, do these joining um, like lectures, and then a lot of the guys when they when they join up now, especially if they get they get a draft that they didn't really like. They're quite happy to moan about the, the shit job that they're in. 
um, but not actually do anything from the outside of it. So, you know, my, my last Marines spot, do that Marines and, and Navy. Yeah. Winging Marines. I didn't think you guys were allowed to do that. What allowed it, it's, yeah. it, it's the first thing that you're taught is how to drip. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my last draft was, was in, in North Devon. So it was in the, uh, the commando logistic regiment. So one of the things I used to say to the guys is, you know, utilize your environment. You know, you've got some of the best surfing beaches on the planet, um, on their day, you know, on your doorstep, you've got the, the beautiful scenery, the sand dunes, you've got miles and miles of sand and cycling routes and all this sort of stuff, spear fishing off the cliffs, go and go and do that. Don't sit in your room and, and fester and, and moan about it, do, some, do something about it. And, and I think the, the, I don't want to sound like an old person here, but yeah, I think the Generation X that's coming through through now is, is very much kind of uh, a media society where, you know, they're, they're quite happy. And I'm guilty of this as well, by the way, you know, sitting on your phones for a couple of hours on end, just scrolling through shite when you could be reading the book or going out and yeah. doing something or, you know, going out and exploring your surroundings, like, a, like I just suggested. Um, and, and that sort of thing, cognitively, especially if you're, you're a veteran, it, it is something that you can, you can really hold on to. Now I'm quite lucky in the way that jujitsu and surfing has, well, surfing has been part of my life since I was 14 years old and has always been my, my anchor and yeah. jiu-jitsu on top of that, I started because when the waves were shit, I yeah. started doing that because it was something else. So I'm really lucky. I've got two anchors that, that I can hold on to if I'm, if I'm struggling with anything, I think. Yeah. And that's what's really kept me grounded over these years. And a lot of my friends that have had mental issues with, I don't know, PTSD or depression or something like that, or even killed themselves, I guess in a way have, have, have not had that. And they've not had like a personal outlet, you know, they finish their job, they go home, they're either drinking or I, I, I don't know, watching something shit on Netflix or something like that. So um, I, I think that the, 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 the society change has been quite prolific really in the last 20 years, especially from, you know, people going away and seeing some horrific, horrific things as well. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's funny. I've kind of ducked it in that uh, I just, my life's always been built around the ocean. And, um, and I raised my kids kind of the same way. And so they both surf and, uh, you know, they're fairly well grounded, all things considered. American education is frightening. Um, I homeschooled them for five years to teach them how to read and write, and know a little bit of history. So they were spared some of it, but, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's an oddly given how hard the world is at this moment and what the future and how it looks fairly bleak. Um, it's staggering the cries for increasing softness and sensitivity and all this stuff. And, and I, I, you know, I'm about to publish a thing I wrote called, um, you know, 2020 year of the rat and the corporate cultural revolution. And uh, I see this kind of cultural revolution that is, is like our version of Mao's corporate revolution and that, oh, you know, you have to, this person gets a little, is a little more equal than this person and this person, you know, and, and it's just not going to end well. And um, in America, I foresee a major shift to the right. And I, I don't see then irrespective of my wants or needs or anything else. I just, I don't see Americans tolerating the kind of anarchy that we've been told we need to accept as the new normal. And, uh, and we'll see. It's just the world is at a very fragile and volatile place right now. P people are feeling very, very insecure. And this winter in Europe with the you know, heating and oil uh, crises that are going to befall, especially places like Germany, um, people will be tested. And people usually fail those tests. 
I'll be going next door and nicking people's chairs and smashing them up for firewood if I have well, to. Well, see, that's you. That's same with me. It's like, what do you get? Oh, and that's why I remember when Obama got elected here and my redneck friends were like, oh, they're going to be coming for your guns. What are you going to do? I'd say, well, I'm going to just go to your house and steal your guns because I know where they all are and you got them and you're going to evacuate. I'm going to be stuck here. And so, yeah, exactly. You got the right commando attitude. You're going to you're going to forage. You're going to do what you got to do. Mate, I'm just waiting for the zombie apocalypse. Fuck all this <laughs> this, this heating winter. I want all the, all the dross to get eaten and then leave only the strong people to survive. Something out of like, the walking dead, maybe. Yeah, and I'll be here. Come on over for a surf, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll paddle across the Atlantic then. Yeah. yeah, kill a few pigs on your way, you know? Let's talk a little bit of a little bit more lighthearted, I think. Sure. So uh, let's let's go back to surfing, I think. Yeah. So um, do you watch much of the uh, the WSL? Do you watch the sort of like the the narrative with the with the World Surf League at the moment, or do you just uh, kind I of do, stay away I from do that? occasionally, but not too much. I find a world title decided at trestles, won by a guy who couldn't even take off on a set wave in Tahiti uh, shockingly embarrassing and and I get in big arguments with my Brazilian friends about this um, but no a totally unacceptable and uh, I find you know I would say John John Florence the best surfer in the world in my opinion or at least one of the top three is the smartest guy out there he's got a beautiful sailboat he's in the Pacific He's uh, he's doing some fun stuff. He's enjoying it, you know, instead of going from place to place and get your 10 surfboards in your bag and lugging them from rental car to rental car. That's not that much fun. And so, um, yeah, so I've, I'm not that excited by the WSL. I, uh, yeah, I mean, there's some amazing guys doing things in surfing these days. You know, Billy Kemper is one of my favorites. The great Connor McGuire, my family man, who's going to host me in Ireland soon. <laughs> he doesn't know that yet, but uh, but in any case, um, yeah, there's some there's some guys really charging the jaw paddle in jaws guys impress me to no end. Um, you know that's next level stuff. Of course, Kai Lenny, even though he's friends with Zuckerberg, um, that sort of took a couple a bit of luster off him but nonetheless it, what he's done is amazing as well so you know we have guys really pushing the envelope to the next level um and the wsl is is just what pro surfing has always been it's always been slightly dodgy and the guy who wins is you know sponsored by the companies that sponsors the tour i mean you know, Mark Richards, great surfer to take nothing away from him. But, you know, he was sponsored, I think, by Lightning Bolt, which was, you know, the head judge, you know, of the IPS was the owner of Lightning Bolt. So, and, and Richards was a legitimate world champ. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that there are conflicts of interest that exist in surfing that would not allow, be allowed in any other sport. And it's a subjective sport. Like, the Brazilian with the giant stance who pumps 20 times to load up for the big McTwister aerial isn't, I'm not going to give that guy the same score. I'd give the guy who pulls into a snaky barrel and weaves his and wobs and wobbles his way through it and comes out the other end, the cloud of spit, but the WSL is going to give it to the, to the stink bug stance guy. And, and so that's where we part company, you know, <laughs> Where's some of the the most iconic and and best places that that you've been to and surfed? Um, I would say, gosh, uh, I really enjoyed surfing in West Australia, and uh, surfed some really gnarly waves there, um, and just really liked the West Australians and had a lot of fun with them, drinking and fighting and doing all those Australian things. And of course, East Australia, which is, is, you know, almost like part of my home, you know, I spent so much time there, uh, but that's much more beautiful, fun, uh, 
backlit, really just friendly waves. Um, the North Shore, of course, um, but, uh, and Baja, you know, Baja was really special and we had a great run there. But I, you know, North Carolina is really pleasant. I had some great waves in Canada, um, you know, some other places in the Pacific. But um, yeah, I think, you know, North Shore, uh, North Shore and Australia and uh, Baja and California are closest to my heart. <laughs> Where did you surf in Micronesia? You mentioned that earlier. Uh, Panape and then another nearby island. Um, and, uh, and it was okay. It wasn't, I didn't get it epic at all. I got uh, French Polynesia better, but that was 1984. So that was a long time ago. And I was by myself surfing reef passes. Yeah. I, I was really lucky last year to go and um, go and surf in Guam. I, I went over there. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I wasn't, I didn't even know where Guam was, to be honest with you, when I got yeah. asked to go and uh, do some surf coaching. But I think I've watched uh, and, and know enough about Second World War history to, to understand oh, yeah. uh, its location now. But yeah, the guy, the guy that was like hosting us there, he um, he took us a bit of a tour around the island, and you know some of those places where you you, you see where the uh, the Marines landed and then started fighting oh. through the jungle is like absolutely horrific. Like I couldn't horrific. even imagine it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it's funny you say that because I went to Truck Island, which was where the Japanese fleet was, and uh, and uh, you know, and I just was there in between surfing and i met two old marines from the uh from world war ii that had been there in the war and uh, and and the alcoholism was so bad in in micronesia at that time that they had a full prohibition but these guys had like handles of uh what was it it was seven and seven canadian club whiskey and seven up and so these, these like 80 year old guys in like jumpsuits and, you know, like hush puppy loafer shoes would invite me to their hotel room, like, come on down to the hooch. And, uh, and I drink whiskey with them. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to buff these guys out. Like, and I organized a boat to take them to like the Admiral of the Japanese fleets bombed out palace on one of the islands and truck. And we had a few complications with the boat and I, they were a little scared they were going to die and drown, but it all worked out in the end. <laughs> I'm sure the stuff that they were drinking would probably make a normal person go blind as well. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. And then there's the Sakao in Micronesia, that weird home brew. And, uh, and then there's some homegrown there as well. So <laughs> when, when I first went to Bali and I got introduced to, to Arak, and yeah. uh, I'd never, I'd never even drunk it before. And it was just kind of like in the local cocktails and stuff there. And I remember I just had, uh, had some stuff straight out of a, a resealed um, glass bottle that I got from some like locals. Fuck me. I was in the absolute hurt locker after that. I tell you, I was like, Oh my God. I did, I did some trips up to, uh, up to Java as well. Some of the, uh, some of the guys that I got friendly with that took me up to G land and, and some of the nights there, I was like, I should not be surfing the next day. I have to drink so how, in that. How was G Land? It was big. I was not particularly good at surfing at that time. And uh, the guy, one of the guys that I was with, was a recovering heroin addict that absolutely ripped. I mean, like, he went yeah. out on like a five, seven shortboard that he probably found in the skip. And he was blasting the back out of G Land. G Land must have been about between six to eight foot solid. It was going from Kongs all the way down to racetracks. And it was just, yeah, we uh we we were stayed in a um in a like an the, the it's called like the National Trust or like the 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 Rangers hut in the middle of the jungle. Yeah. So we were blasting in and out of uh, G Land through the jungle every single day and just kind of like camping outside of the uh the G Land camp. I didn't have a great deal of money then. So I was just kind of like bumming out on the beach there and, and just kind of being told where the keyholes were and yeah, off you go. And I spent a lot of time down at racetracks because it was a little bit smaller and 
you know, going through the keyhole at the top of at Kong's and because it was like was, Cam was uh Camel there? I don't I the West Australian guy, a famous G Land surfer. I, to be honest with you, I didn't I, I walked into the G Land camp once. Um, there wasn't really that many people around. I felt like I was kind of being a bit intrusive and sneaking into somewhere that I shouldn't be. It felt really weird. <laughs> so I just kind of went back to the guys uh, that, that I was with. And yeah, that was a, that, that was an interesting trip. Well, because my co-author for Tie Stick was on the second trip to g -Land. Okay. Yeah, because pot smugglers discovered g -Land. And the first trip was they sailed a Hobie 16 open, you know, open boat from Kuta Beach to g -Land. That's a hell of a sail. That's a massive sail. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, these guys, you know, and they went on to smuggle multi-ton loads of marijuana. So he had uh, certainly uh, no shortage of courage, but yeah those guys really did discover g -Land. yeah it's an amazing place it's yeah. obviously you know quite quite touristified now um you know you've got loads of boat charter boats and stuff going out there and i can imagine you know last time i went there was like 2007 so it, it was quite you know what 14 15 years ago is that right i don't know I, I, yeah so he my co-author i think was there in Gosh, it was 70, at the latest, 74. It's yeah, just a few years before me, though. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I've seen a few documentaries on uh, on that and uh, some of the stories that, that, that come out of that era um, of them guys just, you know, selling weed to, to kind of live the dream and live in the jungle as well, away from yeah. society, basically. It's, it's kind of like... Is it a stereotypical kind of story? Maybe I don't know, but just in a different part of the world, world for that time, I, I don't know. You, you could argue that point, I guess. Well, those guys were uh, basically smuggling to kind of fund the dream, and then the uh, then the money got so big they got caught up in the rest of it. So something that started out as a means to an end became an end and and it ended badly for almost all of them nobody left with much money or didn't go to prison or yeah so the, the so the pot smuggling dream didn't you know didn't pan out it was a it was a good run for a moment of time you know they had some glorious years as young men but then the, the ferryman came and collected Hey, uh, we've been going for about an hour and a half now, so I just right. I'd like to finish with uh, with sure. a quick fire round, if that's okay. Go ahead. Okay, so the first question is: If you had one surfboard fin set up for the rest of your life, would it be single fin, twin fin, thruster, finless, bonzer, or two plus one? Not even a second's hesitation. A single fin. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Favorite submission? Uh, the Irish Barambolo, also known as the Maguire Olo. I like it. Controversial. Don't know what it is. It'd be interesting to see it. Oh, it's bad. I'll, I'll send you a video. The best and the worst person to share a lineup with? Mm, wow. Um, gosh. The worst would be pro surfers, most any few i won't name uh the best would be my kids if you had one place to surf for the rest of your life where would that be bah. pete mcguire it's been amazing talking <laughs> to you and i appreciate your time mate oh no we're going to ireland we're coming we're coming to ireland yeah 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 we're gonna go see my namesake connor mcguire <laughs> yeah, we're gonna go ride some big waves I'll yeah, bring, i'm bringing a nine foot pintail for you <laughs> thanks pete <laughs> all right oh do you thank me uh later <laughs> cheers mate <laughs> okay bye bye and that's it if you like the podcast please like share and subscribe on your podcast provider and leave a little review on apple podcasts thanks for listening